In this episode, I will lay down why policymakers shouldn't only look at the risks of blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies, but instead look at the many benefits and possibilities that come from them. Because blockchain will help us to be empowered again, to live out our constitutional liberties and to fix an internet that might feel broken at times. Welcome to The Blockchain Lawyer, a podcast on technology and law. Dennis Hilleman is an accomplished lawyer with over 13 years of experience and a passion for creating a better future through blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and other disruptive innovations. All statements expressed in this podcast are the opinions of the host and his guests only and are in no way legal or financial advice. And now, here is your host, Dennis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of The Blockchain Lawyer, a podcast that is all about blockchain, about other disruptive technologies that hopefully will change the world, and about the laws and politics that hopefully drive them to do so. My name is Dennis Hillenon, and I'm glad you found the way here. So I just came back from an OECD event in Paris. Uh, I love Paris, great town, always happy to visit. And the OECD event was on the Global Blockchain Policy Forum. So it was a forum, a conference that was all about blockchain technologies, about cryptocurrencies and about the effects they might have on the economy. It was a very interesting event. Uh, there were a lot of high politicians around. The French Minister for Economy, for example, held the first speech but also many central bankers and there was a lot of discussion on the future of blockchain and the policy making, but of course also on the cryptocurrencies and the ever so present topic of Facebook's Libra. Um, I'll get into Libra and uh, cryptocurrencies on this top on this podcast as well in the future. But today I want to focus a little more on the broader picture of blockchain and blockchain in a constitutional context and why um, apps and uh, startups like Elastos and Blockstack could do a lot of good in the future of the internet for all of us. I was part of a panel um, at actually uh, at the OECD Global Blockchain Policy Forum. I was part of a panel, Data Ownership and Privacy Secured by Blockchain. It was a good event. Um, it was on first day and I had a lot of fun doing uh, holding it, had a lot of good conversations after it. Um, the title could be a little um, tricky. It could be asked if the title is correct because data ownership is something that is probably not the right way to call it because you can't own personal data as such as much as you like can't own your legs or arms because if you own something, you can give it away and for example personal data you you can't you can't transfer it in the way of like transferring a car that you own or um, a coin that you own uh, personal data is always related to you uh, as much as your arm or as as much as your soul is so data ownership the title is something that i would put like in in um in, in the context of the whole event um and of course there was a lot of talk in that event about or in that panel about GDPR issues. I will get into this in a different podcast too. But I mainly talked about um, constitutional aspects of blockchain, how blockchain technology could help boost our constitutional liberties again. And I think that's a point that is hardly ever to, to taken into account when talking about policy making for blockchain. And that's what I want to talk about today on this podcast. So who was with me in the panel for um, the, the um, workshop on data ownership and privacy secured by blockchain? The other participants were John Christoph Findori, who was representing Blockstack, actually a really cool guy who's got a lot of knowledge about blockchain economy. Then there was Nikola Cinnamon, who was representing Elastos. And then there was Jörn Abgut, um, who I know personally pretty good already because I'm working with him in the German Institute for Standardization. We're working on a blockchain standard. Um, it's actually called DIN 4997 standard, Who, for anyone who's interested in it, it's a standard on uh, blockchain 
um, and the possibility of privacy by design on blockchain with blockchain technology. So we are tackling a lot of EU GDPR issues with that. But um, and like all three of them really made like a, a good impression, a great impression on me. They taught they taught me again a lot just like by participating in such panels. I learned so much and I'm always thrilled to see how other people approach the blockchain technology. My part in the panel, however, was more um, to give a broader picture of policy making today and a broader picture of what blockchain can mean for all of us when it comes to our constitutional liberties. So I've, that probably might sound very high, um, but if you allow, let me elaborate that a little. Um, let's, let's have a look again. What is, what is blockchain? Um, I talked about that in the, my first episode of a block, uh, of the blockchain lawyer podcast. I explained what blockchain is and what blockchain is probably not. It's a tool, but it's not the solution to anything. Blockchain is a decentralized ledger technology. To make it a little bit simpler and more handy, I call it a decentralized database. And there are four key elements that make blockchain so very, very interesting for all of us. First of all, blockchain is decentralized. Blockchains are managed by a network of nodes rather than by a central authority. And so they are fully decentralized and this prevents any one entity from having full control over the network. That's very important. Keep that in mind for today when we're talking about constitution and blockchain, because the control of one entity over the network is from my point of view, a problem of the internet today. So blockchain, one key element, it's decentralized. Second key element of blockchain technology is transparent. Transactions on the blockchain are constantly being recorded and stored on the blockchain across all the nodes. That means that all participants can view all transactions on the network in real time. The third key element of blockchain is that it's immutable. Blockchains are designed to enable permanent record keeping so that stored data cannot be altered after being added. This makes it an extremely stable and reliable record keeping system. And the fourth element of the blockchain technology is that it's secure. And it's hard to change or destroy blockchains because of its distributed nature. For example, if someone hacked into one of the computers of a network and altered the information there, the network itself, the network of nodes on the blockchain, however, would remain unaffected. This is what I highlighted, especially in the first episode of the podcast, the ability of blockchain technology to keep data secure, to, to prevent hacking of data and alteration of data. This is something that is very, very important when it comes to blockchain. So why am I bringing that up again? If you have listened to the first episode of, uh, of my podcast, you'd already be knowing that. The reason is because I want to have a look on Facebook uh, and I just picked Facebook of one of the four giant players out there in the Internet world, at least the Western Internet world. You know, like uh, there of this Facebook, there's Apple, there's Amazon and there's Google, who pretty much by today dominate the Western Internet. And if you look on f at Facebook and the systems of social media created by Facebook, and this is not meant that I think Facebook is evil. It's just like a, a nature of fact what Facebook is and how Facebook works. Works. Facebook is like pretty much the complete difference of what blockchain stands for. For example, the blockchain is decentralized. Facebook, of course, is a very centralized system because whenever you put data on the Facebook platform or on Instagram or even on WhatsApp, it's like stored on the on the Facebook system and to get access to the system, you must register with Facebook. So Facebook is a very centralized solutions, which of course makes totally sense with their business model. So the second thing um, that blockchain is made of is the transparency. And uh, we've all followed the whole Cambridge Analytics scandal with Facebook and we all know how it is like when you, for example, when you sign up to Facebook or like to any other social media app, 
You probably are aware that you have to that you should read a very long privacy notice. Um, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about when you sign up to a new app or get a new program. There are these huge privacy notices. And let us be honest, um, the only ones reading uh, those privacy notices are probably lawyers who get paid for that. So um, we probably absolutely should be aware what Facebook does with our data um, because of a privacy note, which are probably print, written pretty well by Facebook. But, uh, but also on the other hand, if you're honest, you absolutely don't really know what's happening to your data because you haven't read the privacy notice at all or you just don't keep track of what's happening with your data so i don't actually think that the whole usage of data on the internet today by the big platforms by the big by the big firms is fully transparent as it is with blockchain technology so i would doubt that we could say that facebook or any other of the major players offers a similar transparency as blockchain as blockchain does also, of course, um, by nature, the Facebook uh, system can be immutable because, of course, if you have racist or criminal content, someone must erase that. And that is what Facebook, of course, does. So on that level, um, Facebook is, of course, a system that is not immutable at all. And the fourth thing is, and this, of course, uh, refers back to the to the logic of Cambridge Analytics and uh, to the whole leakage of data that we all know is happening over the internet. I doubt that Facebook is as secure as um, as a blockchain solution could be because hackers, because of the centralized nature of Facebook, hackers could get access to it. So to, keep, to make things simple and to keep it short, um, I think that the major players of today uh, like the very much, very much the opposite of what blockchain uh, system is, and of course this all doesn't only refer to Facebook, which this also refers to other platforms that are out there. This refers to Google as well as to um, other uh, players like Twitter or YouTube. From Google. Uh, so I don't think that uh, we should judge that in a bad way because that is just how the internet has evolved. It's the, internet, it's the internet of networks and probably most of you listening to this podcast are aware of the so-called network effect. Like these platforms live by the simple fact that they offer a network to communicate with others, to do business with others, to keep in touch. So in the moment that others, that more and more people join such a network, this network can not only gather more data to become more powerful with this data by doing better advertising and by, through better advertising of a better services. No, because so many people you know you want to communicate with are already on that network, you naturally join these networks as well. And that is, of course, the reason why, why platforms like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram today grew so much because of this network effect. And that's all fine because it's just how the internet works today. But what I think we should remember is the idea of the internet as such. I mean, if you are really idealistic and look at the internet, what was it meant all about? It was meant to for people to communicate with each other. It is, from my point of view, meant as an expression of freedom, of your ability to get in touch with everybody in the whole world, to do business with anyone in the whole world you want. And it's not like Facebook or Google destroy that idea, not at all. I mean, Facebook probably offered so many people to reach out to others they would have never reached. But these networks have gained so much power today that they probably can rule how the internet of today works more and more. For example, um, if you look at the Facebook algorithms today, I, re I read like a lot of influencer um, comments on, on blogs. I listen to podcasts like that of Pat Flynn and they are highlighting that even if people follow you on Facebook, even if you are, they are a member of your Facebook group, 
Today you can't be sure anymore that they will read your content because in the end the algorithm decides what you get to see and what you don't get to see. And I think that's a scary thought because if the algorithm decides today what I get to see, even if I want to follow someone, even if I want to be part of one group, then we are on a dangerous path today because it makes these networks really powerful on deciding whatever you want to learn, whatever you want to know, or whoever you want to get in contact with. And to let me get this back to blockchain, I think blockchain technology can help that this development is turned around again. And by doing so, by accepting that blockchain technology can contribute so much to fix the internet, as Michael K. Spencer, a writer that I really like on Medium, he wrote a great article um, that, that was titled, I think, The Internet is Broken because of like Google, Facebook, and Amazon dominating so much. If blockchain technology can contribute to fix that, to make the internet a more, a more free place for every one of us, a place where we can communicate again with each other more freely, then I think blockchain technology can help us all a lot. And what I want policymakers to think about when we talk about blockchain, when they are addressing blockchain issues. And of course, there is a lot of risk with blockchain, with cryptocurrencies. You can do a lot of fraud. You can do a lot of bad things. Uh, criminal cults can use cryptocurrencies to um, transfer money easily. I mean, you probably all uh, watched um, How to Sell Drugs Online Fast on Netflix. That worked totally well. Uh, the drug selling in this great show were through cryptocurrencies. Of course, that's the bad things. And but I want to but I want to line out: criminals are coming anyhow. Regardless of what you do, criminals will always find a way to come in. And of course, blockchain technology has to be regulated in a way that it makes it hard for uh, criminals. However, uh, at this point, I want to line out: blockchain technology is all about transparency, and so I'm wondering if criminals actually really want to do so much with blockchain. But anyhow, what I want to highlight is. Don't just look at blockchain technology um, in the idea of that it makes bad things possible because it can make so many good things possible when it comes to the internet issues that I just told you. Because let us look at something. Let us look at our constitutional ideas. Our constitutions, that from Germany, but also that from other countries that are Western democratic they come from a time that there was no internet. They come from an analog time. And if you look at the constitutional rights in them, at the liberties expressed in them, they are liberties that are meant to empower people. They give us the right to free speech. They give us the right to gather each other. They give us the right to practice our religion freely. They give us uh, the right to work as whatever we want in general. They are all about empowering. They give want to give us any right to do the best out of us that we can. That is what our, what our constitutions want. And our constitutions look at us as social beings. They give us this right in a social surrounding. For example, if I want right now, I can go outside and hold a speech on the street about politics, about social issues, about economics, whatever I want. Probably most people would just think, what's this weirdo doing out there? But that's okay. Maybe someone uh, stands there and listens to me and think, hey, this guy has some good ideas. That is what our constitutions want. They want us to communicate with each other. They want us to do business with each other. That is what they were meant to do, to empower us, to make the best out of us, also for the benefits of the whole society. Our liberties are meant for us, but it was the deepest thought of the constitution makers of today, that by granting everybody the best liberties there are, of course setting some borders, but by in general by granting liberties to people, 
when people would do good with these liberties. They would create jobs for businesses. They would form political parties to work for the democracy. They would gather on the streets and protest against developments that are not good for the society. So our social liberties are all about communication. Now let's take a step back and look at the internet of today and the skill and the ability to communicate. A lot of communication, a lot of business making, even a lot of politics as we know are done today on the internet. But where are they done? They are done on, they are done on platforms. They are done through intermediaries like Facebook. Keep our, let's go back to my image with me standing on the street and doing a speech. Right now, I go outside and hold this speech. If we put this in a Facebook context, I would hold that speech on Facebook. But if my speech is transported to someone, if my speech is like going to be listened to by anybody, the algorithms of Facebook decide. And if my speech is on Facebook tomorrow still, Facebook in the end decides. And if my speech is spread all over the internet, even though I maybe didn't want it, that is also decided by Facebook. And you can apply this image to all the other platforms. Can I get access with my goods and services to Amazon? Amazon decides. Will my, feed, will my tweets on Twitter become popular? The algorithms of Twitter play a great role. I mean, you're probably aware today that Twitter doesn't only block users, but also makes the posts invisible. Like, it's the question, uh, how to put it in a constitutional context, it's the question of not only the freedom of speech that you maybe even have when you go on a platform, but it's also the freedom of reach. Can my content actually reach people? And I think that is such a scary thought today that the constitutional liberties that we all want to use for the best for of us, but also for the best of our societies. These constitutional liberties, at least on the internet, are endangered or at least limited or perhaps better to say controlled by big companies, by Facebook, by Google, by Amazon. So this is like the constitutional liberty context. And now let's let, look at the business context. For example, if I want to open up a startup, if I want to make business on the internet and ask yourself, really, can you do this without Google, Facebook or Amazon? Of course, you can say, well, I can put up a, a shop system on the internet. I can put up my own website. Okay, but how do you track people to your website? At, at some point, you'll probably use Google AdWords. At some point, you'll probably use Facebook to make advertisement. Because actually so much traffic, so much communication is done on these platforms that you just can't avoid them. And if you then think a little and you know that 99% of all companies in the European Union are small and medium-sized companies, 99%, then ask yourself, is it right that these companies and their whole business, their whole online business at least, is more and more dependent on the algorithms set and controlled by Facebook and by Facebook, Amazon or Google. Is that what we want? Is that what the makers of our constitution really wanted for us? I personally don't think so. And so that is what I want to tell everyone involved with making policies. You should not only think about the risk that blockchain and cryptocurrencies mean for our societies, the, the, the dangers that they could have because criminals misuse them. But I want you to look at blockchain. I want you to look at cryptocurrencies from a different angle too. I want you to look at it from an angle of that it could empower people, 
but it could empower people to make the best out of themselves, to get in direct contact again over the internet with others, and also to, to know that blockchain technology, with its great benefits of being transparent, of being neutral, of being immutable, of being decentralized, without intermediaries in between, that these great benefits from blockchain technology could help us all to that and now I'm speaking a little again with my uh, from the with the words of Michael K. Spencer, like they could help it could help to fix the internet. Because I don't think anybody likes the situation really as it is. At least most people would not like it to know that so much communication, so much business is controlled by only a handful of companies. Four companies controlling so much at least in the Western world. And then you think again that 99% of all companies in Europe are small and medium-sized companies, now also playing and doing the business in the internet field where four giant companies are controlling so much. So please, whenever you think about policy making of today, please embrace blockchain technology. Please embrace cryptocurrency technology too as a factor that could help us all to make the internet a place where our constitutional liberties, where the ideas of the fathers of a constitution, of our Western democracies, could actually be lived out with the help of blockchain technology in a more and a different internet than it is today. So after this theoretical content, let us go into examples. And of course, since I were in a panel with them at the OECD event in Paris, I want to talk about Elastis and Blockstack. Both are working on creating digital ideas, decentralized ideas for people, but also for digital assets on the Internet. Um, Elastis especially is working on uh, digital IDs for things, so to speak. And I want to I wanna portray this to you in an example. Like... If you are a movie fan, and I'm totally one, you probably owned a lot of DVDs and uh, Blu-ray discs. I, I owned so many until my wife, with good reason, said, come on, guy, throw some out. You own way too much. You're never going to watch that in a lifetime anymore. And uh, since then, I also started like buying movies on Amazon. Because why? It's damn convenient. Like if you have M Amazon Fire Stick or just like an Amazon app on your TV, you can just like browse through this huge catalog of movies and if there's one new movie out you can just buy and buy it and download it and stream it right away and so you think you bought a movie online and you own it but actually do you really own it because who where's where's the ownership of that can you transfer that movie to your friend no why because it's linked to your account on amazon so if you bought, for example, The Last Avengers movie on Amazon, then you can watch it through your Amazon account. But you can't transfer it to a friend. You can't transfer it to your kid that's miles away. You can't sell it. And it, especially, what if something bad happens to Amazon? What if it comes into a scandal? What if it goes bankrupt? What happens to your ownership of the movie? It's gone. Because the, move, the whole platform has gone away you don't get as access to the movie anymore. Perhaps there will be some sort of solution, but actually that's what could happen and what happened with other platforms in the past. So can we actually talk if you bought the movie on Amazon that you own the movie? Or isn't it like rather a part of rental? And the same applies to software that you bought over the internet and that you couldn't like, that you maybe just like use in a cloud, in a cloud storage. Do you really own it? Mo music i bought a lot of music too on apple like do i actually own it what happens to that music if apple is gone somehow if apple goes bankrupt or is shut down by the government is my mu is my music still there so that's the approach of elastos like each piece of music each piece of m movie each copy digital copy of a movie gets a digital idea and then by that if you have a, an idea, a decentralized idea too on the blockchain, an identification on the blockchain, 
that is absolutely and only linked to you, you can own digital things. You can own the digital idea of that movie. And if, for example, you watched the movie, you watched the Avengers movie, then you can like give it to a friend. You can tr you can gift it to a friend. You can transfer it to a friend. And you don't need to. The friend doesn't need to go through your Amazon account or anything. You just you just give away the digital property of a movie. You give away the digital property of music. So and like think back when you were young. When you were younger, you bought movies and you probably gifted them to your friends or sold them to your friends if you have watched them. And now on the internet, you shouldn't be able to do so anymore. You should always be linked with your ownership to Amazon or some other platform. I don't think that's what our constitution really wanted because, like I said, our constitution was all about direct communication and direct business between people. So I think a solution like Elastis is good. Also, for example, if you create a movie, if you wrote a book or if you created a piece of music, you probably don't need anymore to go through Amazon to sell it. You can sell it directly from your website and people can buy it directly from your website and own it. Like, of course, you can say this is possible now now too, but actually would people do that? Um, because they all went, it would go for Amazon. And I know that many people would argue now like you would still probably need uh, marketplaces even for these digital digital things you own for the digital music you want to spread for the movies you want to sell and that's fine but maybe these platforms can be very decentralized as well in the future they can be linked totally to our decentralized ideas and we don't actually need to be amazon or ebay or twitter or whatever they can be other different platforms that, lead, that need less data that need that pro, uh, profit less of our data and take less profit from the selling because this data is not stored anymore in a centralized way. I'm not sure yet. We will see which business models will arise. But if theoretically, with a solution like Elastos, it will be much easier to do digital business on the internet again without an intermediary in between making money from your goods, making money from your services, or even like make the rules how you can sell things. And finally, let's have a look at Blockstack. Uh, Blockstack is a decentralized computer network and app ecosystem that puts users in control of their identity and data. Basically, and I don't want to go into too much details because you can look up the internet site and they just explain it much better there when, any, when I could ever do it. Basically, they're working on a decentralized identity. They want to put you in the ability to have a, an ID on the internet. That is 100% linked to you. That is you and nobody else. And I think that is a perfect cool idea because it will make communication over the internet so much better. Because if an idea on the internet is 100% for sure you, then, any, then a lot of things will get much easier. For example, let me just like give you a very quick example. I had to register for the OECD event and I got a ticket online. I got a ticket that had a barcode. That was all fine, that was all digitized, that was all modern. But it also said, if you come to the event, please show the ticket, show the barcode, but also pl please bring an ID with a photo that proves, hey, that's absolutely you. And that's like the way we live. That's the way we live in so many ways. We've got like these digital solutions that could give us it could give us tickets to events, tickets to the airplane, tickets to the train online that we can have on a smartphone. But when it comes to proving our identity, we still need paper documents. And so all these ticket solutions are always linked to like paper documents. And that's weird to me in a world, in the world where we live in. So if we have a decentralized idea, if we have an idea that is 100% certain you and nobody else, then this would go away. And also this would allow you to be much easier, to have much better access to your data and access to applications. Like for example, now when you register to a new app, to a new platform, you always have to register with a different handle, a different login, a different password. And that of course is a hassle remembering all that. 
I'm sure everyone listening to that to this had at one point or the other the problem that she or he couldn't remember her ID or password on a system. Now, if you have a digital ID and you link an app to this digital ID, you don't need any more centralized solutions like centralized database with your ID and your personal data. And you choose with this decentralized identity how much personal data you want to share with a platform. And you can make sure that it only gets that personal data that it needs to. And all the transfer of personal data, if we go back to the basic idea of the blockchain, all this transfer of idea of data will be transparent and everything happening because it will happen on the blockchain will be immutable so you can keep track of what's going on with your data. And for this, a decentralized identity solution like Blockstack is a perfectly fine idea. Also, from a very practical point of view, if you want to transfer cryptocurrencies today, today uh, maybe some of you have, have done that, you need you and the recipient of your cryptocurrency need a wallet. And a wallet address is way complicated. It's a long number of, of it's a long number um, mixed with letters in it, and nobody can actually remember that in in their head. We we all have to write it down. We all have to have it in emails or whatever. And if you want to transfer then Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies to a friend, you got to know his wallet ID as well, and you got to make sure when you transfer it that you wrote down. The, the wallet address you want to transfer the Bitcoin to of your friend exactly how it is written. Because if you do one mistake, hell, I mean, your Bitcoins could be gone into Nirvana. So if we got a decentralized ID, then that, well, then that will change. Because like the ID could be like Dennis ID. That is like the dream of Blockstack, but this is like my ID on the block of the blockchain on the Blockstack blockchain. Dennis ID. And if you want to send me something, you just have to type in Dennis ID as a recipient, not a whole long wallet address. And the same goes for me if I want to send something from my wallet to somebody, I just have to type in as Dennis ID as my wallet address or like my identity, and of course, then like John Doe's ID for the recipient. So, and I think with this solution, Blockstack has the possibility to make cryptocurrencies much more user-friendly and to make the transfer of money on the internet much easier. And of course, this is just like one part of it, the whole idea of decentralized identity that Microsoft is actually working two on two. Sometimes it's called like decentralized identities when it's with a blockchain solution. Sometimes you read digital IDs as well. This whole idea is a very good idea because and now we want to look back at the constitutional point. What, were, what, are, what are our constitutions about? They are about empowering us. They are about direct communication, about direct businesses. What are the dangers to these liberties, to these rights everybody has for his or her own good, but also for the good of the society. The dangers lie into the strong intermediaries today on the internet, the big companies that own marketplaces, that run the social media system, that know all about you. Like they put you in danger, that they control how and when you can use these liberties. So if blockchain, solution, blockchain solutions like Blockstack or Elastos help us to overcome these hurdles, to destroy or at least weaken the control of the big companies on the internet, then that is for me, for me personally, an expression of constitutional liberties. And this is what I want policymakers to remember when whatever they do, they should remember that blockchain isn't only a risk, but blockchain is and always will be a great possibility too, so we can live out our constitutional freedoms also in a modern internet world. Thank you for listening. I hope you had great fun and we'll look into more blockchain related issues uh, in the next episodes. Hope to hear you again. Bye bye. If you want to learn more about Dennis, please visit his website, theblockchain.lawyer.
or connect with them on LinkedIn or Twitter. Until next time, everyone. 